Hi everyone, Tom Loria here. Welcome to the shop. And before we get started with today's video, I'd like to say thank you to those of you who have been writing to me and uh, because of my recent absence over the last six months, uh, have been a little concerned about my health. Uh, I'm fine, ain't nothing wrong here. Uh, I've just been very busy and it hasn't allowed me time to uh, get away to do some videos. But uh, that's changing. I'm still busy, but I'm definitely making sure I allow time to do these videos. And speaking of videos, let's get started with this one. It's about making moldings with scratch stocks. It's, an, it's about as old school a way to make complex moldings as you can get. Uh, there are some high-tech or mechanical aspects to it, but very little. And uh, I hope you get something out of this. Let's check it out. Now this whole approach to uh, making moldings using scratch stocks implies that you're going to need a few things. Um, in a perfect world, you'd have everything that I'm about to mention. But even if you don't, you can still make this work and still get pretty good, pretty consistent results. So let's take a look at what we got here. Uh, first of all, you're going to need material to make the scratch stock with, the actual scraper. I like using these X-Acto blades. Um, they fit in this handle or the, I think it's the number 22 handle, I'm not sure what it is, but the long cylindrical aluminum handle. Either one of those two is fine. I prefer this one only because it fits my grip better. Um, and it's shorter and it's a little less flexy. So that's why I like to use that one. To actually cut the profile into this, now the first thing I should mention first, the very first thing I do is with either of these blades is I take a grinding wheel and I grind off the actual cutting edge because you're going to be handling these a lot and uh, you could lose a lot of blood if you don't do that. Uh, it wouldn't be good. Okay, so the first thing you do is dull the cutting edge as I've done here. You can see, I don't know, maybe you can see, maybe you can't, but I've really dulled that down so it's just like the uncutting side of the blade. Next, you're going to have some things to actually cut the profiles in with. Now you can, uh, if you have a Dremel and you have some of these emery grinding wheels, these things are great. Uh, you put them on a little mandrel like that, they're roughly 18 thousandths. So that means the thinnest cut you're going to get in any of this is 18 thousandths, obviously. If you need it finer than that, you may want to go to a saw blade, but with these you really need to be careful because they're a little unpredictable and they could grab on at some point and just come flying up at you. So you really need to be careful with those. I prefer not to use them myself if I can get away with it. Another alternative to using a rotary saw like that is to use a jeweler's saw. This one's got a broken blade, but you get the idea. A jeweler's saw like that, you can make very fine cuts and uh, it's, it's about the safest way to do this. Um, once you get the cuts in, to the piece that you're making, you can always refine them with files, which you'll do anyhow, regardless of what you use. Uh, another key component to this, to this method that I've sort of developed, uh, and all of this came about as uh, necessity is the mother of invention kind of a thing. Um, if you're making a long piece of molding, like this is, I don't know, maybe about 11, 12, 13 inches, something like that. And if you're going to make that, you need some way to hold it. I mean, this is pretty whippy. And if you tried just laying it down on a table like that and going along it with the scraper, chances are you're going to get pretty erratic results. So you need something to stabilize this whole thing. And what I've come up with is just two pieces of wood and this can be anything at all. I just happened to grab mahogany because I had a scrap of mahogany laying around the shop um, that I wasn't going to use for anything else. It's about a quarter of an inch wide or a quarter of an inch in thickness and, I don't know, five-eighths of an inch and one inch over here. Um, and 
what I do with this is I'll take a piece of two-sided tape, two-sided adhesive tape, and put it on this piece. Then I lay my stock in there and have it come up, but I'd have the stock standing proud of this. Then it's stuck on with the two-sided tape. Then this gets this other piece gets put on also so that your scratch your stock that you're going to form stands proud like that so you've made a sandwich then it goes in a vise and the whole thing gets secured in the vise but it's still unsecured at both ends so I use a couple of C clamps and clamp the whole thing up nice and tight and you'll see all this uh, a little bit later in the video so that's some of the stuff you'll need always handy to have a good pair of calipers whether digital or vernier calipers doesn't really matter whatever your pref preference is use it um, and again I started this whole thing by saying in a perfect world there are certain things that you would have and one of those things is a table saw okay so here's my table saw it's a burn saw made by Jim Burns down in Florida great little machine this is the way you're going to a size your rough stock and then B separate the molded part of your stock from the unmolded part it's my advice that you start off with as large a piece of stock as you can without being too wasteful. In other words, if you're going to make a, uh, a molding that, say, for your model needs to be, oh, let's say, uh, a sixteenth of an inch deep by an eighth of an inch wide, make your stock eighth of an inch to accommodate the profile, but instead of trying to get it close to a sixteenth of an inch right off the bat, I would make it something like three sixteenths of an inch and you would size that on the table and once you've got that sized rough like that then you take it over make the molding then you would bring it back to the saw and set this for your sixteenth of an inch or whatever it needs to be to get the proper depth and then run it through it's a whole lot easier to do it that way your stock is more stable it's thicker and deeper so it's it's less whippy and you'll get much more consistent results that way so make sure you make your stock oversized but not to the point of being wasteful the other good thing is you can make it even a bit bigger than that and you can profile both sides of the stock and then rip the pieces off one as one after the other as you need them this way out of that one piece of stock you can get two lengths of molding and uh, it also allows you to keep the saw set to let's say that that theoretical sixteenth of an inch that we mentioned earlier if it has to be sixteenth of an inch you run it through you've got a sixteenth inch by eighth inch molding you flip it over and do it again now you've got two pieces of molding and they're really pretty much the same exact size within one or two thousandths of each other um, that's the advantage of having a really accurate table saw yeah. to make the scratch stock I lay out the important dimensions of the molding the overall height a tenth of an inch, and the depth of the cuts, 60 thousandths and 120 thousandths. I have an emery wheel in the lathe chuck, and I've mounted the blank into a horizontal tool holder. The first two cuts will establish the finished height of the molding, and they will go into the blank only 60 thousandths at this point. From there, a series of cuts will be made to clear away all the unwanted material. When all the waste is cut away, I advance the depth of the cut by one or two thousandths and give the piece one final sweep to clean it up. Now the actual cutting can really start. At what will be the top or the head of the molding, I make a single cut to the finished depth, in this case 120 thousandths. I back the wheel out, advance the slide, and take another cut. This one not quite so deep. For this and all subsequent cuts, I don't measure. This is done strictly by eye. And the process is repeated until I reach what will become the bottom of the mold. And I usually try and make one more shallow cut at the bottom to make a rebate in the finished molding. You'll see this later.
Now, before I can actually use the scraper, I have to do one more thing. I have to make sure that all non-cutting surfaces are smooth and will not remove any material. In the case of this molding, those are the very top and bottom surfaces. These surfaces are the guides that will allow for consistent cutting. It wouldn't hurt to go over the outside bottom edges as well because you may come into contact with the wooden clamp during the scraping process and you wouldn't want those edges removing any material from your clamp. This is simple to do and it only takes a minute or so. I remove the burr with a grinding wheel and then take a few passes with a finish file and you're done. Now the type of wood you use for your molding will depend on the shape and complexity of the molding itself. The default choice among model makers for centuries has been boxwood, but it's expensive and the good stuff is getting hard to find. If your molding is complex, you definitely will want a very hard wood. Some species you might consider are boxwood, pearwood, white holly, apple, maple, and cherry. All good choices, but these last two tend to have grain that will reverse. And if that happens during your scraping, you'll probably run into tear out. So be careful with those two. Now in this photo, I ran the same molding using five different woods. Actually, I made six samples altogether, but the white holly sample didn't make it into the photo. I'm not sure how that happened, but it doesn't really matter because a bit later you'll see me using the new scraper to make a crown molding out of that wood. Now of the samples I made, Pearwood, and boxwood, and white holly are my clear favorites for a large majority of the applications. Of the softer woods, I think really poplar is the only viable choice here. And it should only be used for moldings that really don't have a lot of detail. Things like shear strakes or bullnose moldings can be made effectively from poplar. Now, even though it's just generally not applicable, there are times when basswood and poplar can be used successfully. In this photo of the deck house, the beadboard was made from poplar. Since I needed a good amount of the stuff and the detail was minimal, it made sense to use a cheaper and more readily available wood. So be sure to assess each situation and fit the wood to the task. Now here you see I have the blank stock secure in my improvised device. I've also checked to see that I will be running this with the grain, not against it. And keep in mind that the profile of the molding will be cut into the surface that faces up towards the ceiling. The top of the molding is to your left in the frame and the bottom is to your right. Now your first pass down the blank will set the tone for the entire piece. So make sure you have an unobstructed path from one end of the blank to the other. Be certain there are no edges of the clamps or vice handles or anything to interfere with your hand or your scraper's travel. Now I've sized my stock to fit snugly but smoothly between the upper and lower faces of the scraper, but it's still important to maintain a firm, consistent pressure on the top of the molding. Remember, that's the side of the scraper that appears to the left in the frame. Now don't bother trying to start right at the near end of the blank, but do try and get all the way to the far end. Light but firm pressure here. Try and let the scraper do most of the work and the end result will be better for it. Now in this photo, you can see there's a slight flat spot right at the end. And this is pretty normal, and it illustrates a fact of life most carpenters and cabinet makers are very familiar with. When figuring out how much molding to run, build in about 20 to 25% waste. If you need two feet of crown molding, make two and a half feet, or better still, three feet. You'll never curse yourself for having made too much molding. Off camera I sliced the molding free from the blank and cut opposing 45 degree miters in the ends. Now just for this video I'll glue them onto some scrap piece of wood just so you get an idea of what the finished thing will look like. Other than that there's not a whole lot for me to narrate here so I'll be quiet. And you can take in the wonder of my blinding speed and my excruciating precision. Be back soon.
and there you have it, moldings from scratch. It's not nearly as hard as you thought, and with a bit of practice, you'll be turning out moldings like a genuine mill shop. Now some of you may be thinking, moldings? Seems like an awful lot to go through for such a limited visual impact. To which I might say something like, yeah, but have you seen this? Or uh, this? Even a modest vessel like this small 19th century whaler needed four different scratch stocks. How much duller and so much less unconvincing it would have looked without the application of those few moldings. Knowing how to make moldings is not the thing that's going to make you the master of your craft. It's just another resource in your toolbox. And it's one more element in my own quest to make every model I build convey that compelling impression of an actual vessel. It gives the observer one more thing to discover and to consider, one more thing to engage and inspire. As always, I hope you found something useful in this video. And over the years that I've been building, there have been many people who've taught and inspired me. But they can only reach one or two people, or maybe at best a room full of people at one time. With YouTube, I am able to pass on the things that I've learned to thousands of people all over the world. I get to pay it forward at a scale I could not have imagined a generation ago. So thank you for listening and watching and wanting to grow. And until next time, I wish you well. Now, break's over. Get back in the shop.